It truly was a beautiful planet. Brown of third stage thought to themselves. The cliff face they sat on overlooked a massive hydrocarbon fall, which descended a thousand or so metres to an open desert mesa, which they knew stretched the distant seas of the southern region of Four. They'd never thought they'd expire here, so far from the set marks of home. They'd only been through the sorting once. They'd only recently aged enough to meet their offspring. They almost laughed. Their unit would receive much acclamation for their actions here today. They supposed that should bring them some satisfaction. But with more thought, they realised that it both did not and that it did not matter. No one else would ever know they had a moment of anything other than the courage and bravery they were sure the order was baking up at one. Still though, it was a beautiful planet. The mission itself was the first of what was hoped to be many, the capstone of the Order's actions, intended to showcase both their social superiority and represent the future of their species. It had been a 16 rotation trip with seven others, all of which from other units, a fact which had just proven the Order's superiority to traditional structures. They had enjoyed their time with the other experts, and found themselves surprised in how much they began to operate as a unit. Red of Sixth Stage and themselves had especially found common interest. Red had played multiple instruments from one's northern regions, and Brown themselves had studied music as a minor during their work on mathematics at a younger age. During the long and often boring trip through the planetary discs, they'd often found small corners of the transport ship to play together. Eventually, the rest of the crew would arrive and watch them play, all silent, while the stars passed by silently in the distance and their planet grew smaller with each passing moment. The crew commander, Orange of First Stage, themselves, had complimented Red and Brown's plane, and Brown had overheard Orange passing their music back to auto control during one data transmission. They had been mildly embarrassed at imagining the order passing the music out, and shuddered slightly at the idea of units all over one, listening to the strange sounds of a mathematician and engineer play together on a starship far away. And yet, Somewhere deep inside, they felt a kindle of excitement that others were listening. The arrival and landing had been started, as standard as the first time landing on another object within their solar system could be. Black of Ape Stage had been the first to make planetfall, stepping down onto the planet, followed by the rest of us. For a long moment, none had spoke, overlooking the open green-brown mesa, dotted with the strange plant life of four so alien to us. Then... With great purpose and dignity, Orange had stepped past all of us, and although they couldn't receive Orange's scent, Brown was certain Orange was filled with a wondrous awe and strange sense of happy excitement they all felt. Orange had stood ahead of them for another long moment before simply stating, We, of many, come as one. At the time, Brown had found themselves nodding along, a statement in alignment with order doctrine, although they supposed it could be interpreted as many things depending on the viewpoint. They supposed the other collections would try and argue Orange's statement was secretly an acknowledgement of their beliefs, but Brown quietly would have disagreed. After the long trip, they knew Orange referred not to the complex politics of their home planet, but to the strange crew that had arrived together, alone, so very far from home. The next four cycles had been busy. So busy, Brown found themselves struggling to remember all the details. Soil samples to assess crop viability for possible future settlements. Geographic angle measurements to confirm probe-based sensors in orbit were operating properly. And perhaps more importantly, preliminary base construction, culminating with the placement of the home base module on the final day. The crew had been proud in that moment, taking another moment together after the rush to accomplish so many tasks to admire their handiwork. The odd orange and yellow structure stood starkly against the browns and greens of the open space it rested on, like an offspring's plaything placed haphazardly in the unrestricted area of a habitat. With the addition of the power cables running to generators harvesting cycle energy, it almost looked like a home. The problem had begun then, although none of them noticed until much later. A single puncture, perhaps made when they have collectively removed cargo from the hull to the bioreserves, had leaked the life fluid of their operation onto the deck of the ship. Moment by moment, glug by glug, the greenish stick source of life for the mission drained away. Brown had left the crew to admire the new structure, 
seeking a moment to reflect internally and finding the top of the ramp leading to Old Hold, a good place to overlook the landing slope of his construction completed. They had stood there for only a few moments before adjusting their appendage and feeling a slight resistance upon attempting to raise it. Looking down, they had seen the fluid and rapidly traced it back to its source with a sinking feeling that turned to dread upon their suspicions being confirmed. They had plopped the leak easily, a single bit of universal tape having done the job, and stared at the hole in the biofluid container before slumping backwards onto a box of soil samples. They had sat there a long moment, unable to hear the sounds of their crewmates outside before hastily running into the ship to procure a pad and writing utensil, drumming their upper appendage against the ship's hull impatiently in the pressure lock. Racing inside, they began writing calculations, hoping without reason that the math they'd already done inside their head was somehow wrong, and somehow the leak wasn't the doom of at least one of the crew. They had completed the calculations by the time the pressure lock led them back into the hold. They were still sitting there, staring across the hold, when the rest of the crew returned up the ramp, led by Red and Black. Both quickly noted something was wrong, and, following Brown's gaze, slumped in shock. Orange had quickly called a meeting to order, and Brown had presented their findings. Before Orange or any of the others could offer an alternative, Brown had volunteered to stay. The others had disagreed. Surely there was another solution, another way. Brown had told them there was not. They were right, there wasn't, and they all knew it. Brown was the best at calculations between the lot of them, and even if they discarded the mass of the soil samples, even without an observation of the satellites of four, there was no way for them to achieve the acceleration and speed required to return to one before biofluid suppliers ran out. They were the one whose offspring were least bonded with. They were the one who was least ingrained into the ritual of the sourcing, whose loss would be easiest to take. And for the crew, their role was merely a redundancy. The rest of them could also do the calculations required to check the work of the machinations on board the ship, just not quite as fast as Brown could. And that was okay. Brown had already done the calculations. They'd leave them their notes. And although Brown didn't say it, they had been the one to find the problem. And because they had found it, it was their responsibility to fix it. They had argued amongst themselves long into the dark half after inquiring with order command back at one to see if there was another solution. The response had been less than encouraging. Order command had come up with the same grim realisation Brown had. They only had enough biofluids for seven to return, and even that was cutting their supplies to an extremely close margin to ensure survival. Watching the ship launch without them was a moment Brown didn't know how to feel about. They had accepted their fate, at least logically, the moment they seen the fluid leak and the numbers had flashed through their mind. As the bright flash of the ship's engine became smaller and smaller in the sky, Brown found themselves already understanding their fate. They always felt a grim but deep pride in their decision, and an inexplicable joy in being the only living member of their species on an entire uncharted alien world, even one as well surveyed remotely as four. And yet, deeper still, there was a growing, yawning emptiness, a sadness and loneliness and deep primal fear that Brown had never felt before. This new and almost panic-inducing feeling fought inside them against their logical brain and grim satisfaction leaving their insides an uneasy and bubbling sea of complex emotions they had no preface for. They had never been a particularly special sentient, they thought. They ate, slept, learned, disseminated to units, along with the rest of their fellow offspring badge. They studied at a fairly standard place of learning, met a few pre-unit sourcing groups, only ever consumed standard, untainted biofluids, Never joined in any of the philosophical or large-scale reasoning sessions that so defined modern one politics these days. Their only defining special feature, personality-wise, was their incredible ability to do complex and elongated multivariable mathematics, which had, eventually, landed them a position on the exploratory mission. And even then, Brown reasoned, they were still by far the least exciting member of the crew. If asked, anyone would have said the same. And now, here they were, the sole member of their species, further away from every other member than any sentient before them, and they were alone, a single explorer, able to give information and hope and the chance of a role model and maybe a beacon for their entire civilization to be better, do better. Here they were, 
sacrificing themselves and saving the entirety of their crew. A selfless, great representation of what any individual can aspire to be. And yet, and yet they were utterly terrified. Looking back down away from the ship carrying their comrades away, taking in the partially completed habitat that would not be used for another 24 large cycles, seeing the greens and browns and far off hydrocarbon fall, all backlit by the light of their distant star and the great expanse of space rising up above them. That deep gnawing pit suddenly overcame them, and they wept. It was half a cycle before they calmed down enough to think clearly again. They took stock of their situation. Their environmental suit was dirty but still pressurised, and they had last engorged two cycles ago, leaving them another 14 cycles before they would... expire. Brown nearly sat as the word passed in their head, although this time the gnawing feeling only raised itself slightly, having done its worst earlier. Expire. They were going to expire here. They were going to expire here, and no one was going to get them for another 20 large cycles at least, and likely longer than that. And they were going to expire of biofluid deprivation. A way they'd been told since a youngling was a horrible way to go. A way using torture and punishment, a way that caused the mind to unravel and the body to fail. Although, through their calculations, often involuntary, they realised with no small degree of frustration, the worst of the symptoms would not appear for another 12 cycles. 13, if they reserved their energy usage. So they had 12 days, on an empty planet, alone. To do what? Looking around, Brown found their gaze rest upon the small bag of personal items they had taken off the ship. Completely inconsequential and useless for survival, yet somehow... They are slightly comforted, Brown, when they've made their decision. Picking the bag up, Brown dug around and found the tiny instrument inside. Picking it up, they turned it around, examining it, and thinking. Four was a challenging place for life to exist. Its pressure was far lower, and atmosphere far less dense than one's. And it lacked the core component of life, biofluid. This required any colony on the planet to bring their own crops for artificial conversion to biofluid, a process only recently perfected. And converting the land to grow the crops was a major challenge. But life could exist here. That's why it had been selected for study. Two and three were far too rocky, and their atmosphere is too thick for feasible colonization, and the pressures were far too high. Here, however, pressure was lower. And that meant that, conceivably, sapiens could survive without their pressure suits. The suits were more to protect against contamination risk than anything else, and Brown was realising there was no risk of contaminating anything if they were never going back to a place that could be contaminated. Taking the helmet off had been the first step, and after feeling the atmosphere move against their exterior, Brown had rapidly decided to ditch the entire garment. It wasn't needed anymore. Feeling the planet move, breathe, as the botanists would say of their precious crops around them, was a feeling indescribable. It felt as though they were in the lightest of gaseous rivers, almost akin to a hypercarbon bath, but so much more fluid and light. With the movement of the atmosphere and the light of the distant star beating down on them, Brown found themselves slowly lowering to the ground and allowing their gaze to darken, simply basking in the world they found themselves upon. They had laid like this for another half cycle, thinking of nothing in particular for perhaps the first time in their existence, another thing to consider before expiration. They supposed, before suddenly remembering the contents of the bag beside them and the instrument in their appendage. Sitting up, they found the star setting slowly in front of them, basking the entire scene in the dim red light that they found so alien yet so strangely beautiful. Standing, they picked up their bag and hung it over their frame, keeping the instrument in their right appendage. Taking the step, they made their way the short distance to the cliff face, overlooking the hydrocarbon fall, and sat. And, after a long moment, staring across the open brown plains, brought the instrument to their primary orifice, and began to play. The melody was rough at first. Brown had mostly played the complex songs of the poet of one, who jealously guarded the creation of new melodies to be shared outside their ranks. Brown had experimented alone, of course, with their own melodies and ideas often trying to pair them with the equations and any especially vexing calculations they might have been working on, but never in any serious capacity, and certainly never without the guise of mathematical involvement. Yet, they found as the melody improved, slowly, 
then the gnawing feeling deep inside them was slowly fading, replaced by a satisfied, low melancholy that for the first time felt very much like who they were. They played like this for a long time, a cycle, then another, then three, stopping only to sleep under the stars during the dark half. At some point they brought their pressure suit to use as a more comfortable bed against the rocks below them, their helmet sitting beside them like a lonely listener. For some reason, Brown had turned on the communications transmitter with the helmet. They weren't sure why. The ship was too far gone for communications, and the signal far too weak to pass all the way back to one. Yet, somehow, as they played, they felt better, as if the helmet itself was an entire audience come to see their poetry encapsulated in an increasingly complex mathematical formula that was more movement and flow than numbers and growth. The music had begun to flow, and with each passing day it became more defined, more shaped towards some unknowable goal. Brown found themselves lost in the art, and although some small a part of themselves wondered if it were the effect of biofluid deficiency, they realised they didn't care. The effects of the vista with distant stars reflecting down upon an open rise with a long river running into the distant horizon, the hydrocarbon falls roaring to their side, their instruments seemingly perfectly tuned for the environment against Oz Brown would have hesitated to calculate fully, and their complete and utter isolation amongst the lonely expanses around them seemed to draw the music from their appendages with an ease that they had never known existed within the universe or themselves. By the seventh day, the music had become something more, a story, a sweeping message to the cosmos, a question and an answer, and a request to dance all in one. By the eighth, Brown no longer slept, they just played straight through the cycles, embracing how the environment changed around them as darkness fell and the star rose in the light time. By the ninth, Brown could tell the song was drawing to a close, the same way one could feel a particle storm moving in the far distance on one. And on the tenth day, just as the star began to rise in the sky, Brown exhaled the last of their gas flow, allowing silence to reign again. Brown was no longer afraid. They were going to expire, and that was okay. In some way, Brown realised they felt they had accomplished what they had been meant to do. The message was there, sent in secret to a universe that they knew was listening. A long moment stretched by before the helmet made a noise. Startled, all Brown could was stare. There was a pause, then another noise, and another, and then Brown was scrambling to place the helmet back over themselves and confirm what they were hearing was accurate. A moment of static passed, and then a clear voice speaking in clear sentient echo for the transceiver. Unidentified castaway, this is the UEF melee, broadcasting all frequencies, respond if you are receiving. Another long moment passed as Brown processed what they were hearing. The helmet spoke again. Unidentified castaway, this is the UEF melee, broadcasting on all frequencies. Can you hear me down there? Respond if you are receiving. Brown thought hard. There was no way for the ship to have returned. They would have long executed a hard burn and be accelerating away from four on route to one. No doubt with sorrow in their hearts and order command interrogating them for details. Both, they reasoned, to better understand what error had been made and in preparation for what they were sure would be a moving epic of a tale that would elevate Brown to near mythical levels of bravery, and undoubtedly bring a few more of one's many other political groups under order control. There was also no way for it to be a transmission from one. First, they hadn't received anything in the last nine cycles, and there was no way for order command to boost their transmitting or receiving strength enough to communicate with Brown. Most likely, Brown thought was that they had somehow miscalculated the effects of biofluid deficiency in their heart and emotional state, and were experiencing hallucinations earlier than expected. Yet even this idea Brown cast out. They had checked and double-checked how long they'd have before death, and even considered the cliff face an alternative if symptoms appeared and became too much to bear. It was only the tenth day, and although they were beginning to feel mildly sluggish, they should have another two days before the real symptoms began to affect them. So who was talking to them? After a hesitant excel, Brown responded. UEF Mealy, I am Brown of Third Stage, mathematician assigned to the Order Exploratory Mission to Four. To whom am I speaking? There was a short delay, and then an excited voice rang through the helmet with a volume that almost caused Brown to flinch away. Interwoven in the voice's words were short interjections from a far less engaged voice that Brown recognised as a machination of some kind. 
Brown of Thirst Stage. This is the United Expeditionary Fleet Exploratory Vessel Melee. I arrived a short time ago in your system and picked up a signal. When I tuned it, I was greeted with the music you were just playing, so I followed you here. I see you seem to be in a bit of a situation. Can I offer you a lift? Brown's mind raced with the ramifications of what the voice was saying. They had never heard of the United Expeditionary Fleet, nor a vessel called Melee. The only ships in orbit were the ship that had taken and left them there, and orbital vessels near one. And there was no way to falsify transmissions this far out. There was no one to even attempt to do so, which meant... Brown slowly, carefully, spoke into the helmet's transceiver, was hesitant to ask the question, as though the voice might disappear and they might be left with just static. UEF Melee, am I to believe, then, that you are not a sentient of this system? How would you communicate with me in a method I can understand? Brown paused and almost angrily added, And do you realise how large of a mathematical improbability it would be for you to appear just as I approach death, stranded and alone on a planet by myself? There was another brief delay before the voice in the helmet spoke again. Brown of Thirst Stage, I probably should have led with that. I've had a few partial cycles to travel towards you. I've been picking up the ambient transmissions from your planet and have been having my machination translated and define the basics of your culture for me. Yes, I'm a sentient from a different system. I'm a human from a planet called Earth. And yes, I am aware of the extreme and unbelievable improbability of our encounter here. Exalted noise generated to signal humor. But the universe works in mysterious ways, my new, closely linked, non muted acquaintance. The voice grew softer. And biological female entity likes to look out for us explorers. I think that biological female entity has got a soft spot for those of us out there, all alone in the dark. There was another pause, and Brown found himself scrambling to imagine what to ask next. Was this real? Were there other sentient groups from outside their system? It had been theorised in the highest levels of thought sessions, but never prepared for. A sudden concern rose in Brown. UEF Mealy, why would you help me? This time the delay was noticeably shorter, and the voice more reserved in their tone. There's a few answers to that, and I can understand your concern. To address the obvious, we are not interested in military conquest or organisational control of your planet or society. And technically, I am subservient to Federation laws regarding those who travel in space, in distress such as yourself. Plus, the opportunity for me personally to make first contact with a new civilization is an incredible one, likely to bring a fair deal of wealth to me. But that's not why I came here, and that's not why I want to help you. They could give me a planet's worth of wealth, and I just use it to buy a faster ship. Exalted noise generated to signal humor. I want to help you because we're explorers. Hey, look up to the horizon about 16 degrees angle, one fourth quarter midline planetary solar intersection axis. Brown looked at first finding nothing. Then after a moment, they realized one of the stars was moving and becoming rapidly brighter and brighter. I'm not sure about your sentient group, but my sentient group has always explored. At first we looked across our rivers, then lakes, then oceans, and used the stars to guide us to new lands. The star in the sky was slowly getting brighter. Then, we looked up at our natural satellite and, with monumental effort, launched ourselves to its surface to explore what was there. The star was slowly gaining a trail as it entered the upper atmosphere. Then we looked across our system and began to explore each planetary object within, a scientific basis growing from temporary to permanent, and from scientific to industrial, and then finally to cities. The star was now glowing brilliantly bright, brighter than any other star in the sky, and the trailer left wound over the horizon. And then we left our system, figured out how to finally sail among the stars. We found others who had been alone in that big, lonely, dark expanse, searching for others just like them. The star was now glowing less brightly now, and moving rapidly towards Brown, the trail slowly unfolding behind it. And eventually we found ways to cooperate, to work together, to learn and grow, and eventually to turn together to the stars and push out again into the unknown. The star was no longer a star, but a ship, like any Brown had seen before. Where well, the ship they'd arrived in had been capable of vertical flight alone, and this craft travelled horizontally almost as though it were an atmospheric craft of one. It had short wings, and as it approached Brown realised it was an incredibly large, large enough to easily fit five or six of the ships they had used to travel to four inside. The craft, which Brown could now see in detail, complete with viewports and strange alien, ALIEN writing, and a singular grey colour, was now above them, 
hovering in the atmosphere without any discernible sign of propellant. As Brown watched, a small opening appeared on the side of the craft, and a much smaller craft launched, beginning to descend towards where they stood, watching in awe. Why am I helping? Because I know what it was like to be alone and afraid in this dark and unknowable universe. My sentient group and every other sentient group we have encountered has stood in the exact same position you stand today. And some of us had to do it alone. The face that dialed us with the same fear and trepidation I imagine you might have felt. The craft that descended with a speed that made obvious to Brown the technology contained inside must be beyond anything one could develop currently. It slowed as it reached level in front of them, and for a moment it sat, hovering over the canyon, just barely touching the cliff's edge. Then, a large door slowly opened, and a tall figure, with two long upper and two long lower appendages, stepped out onto the ground in front of Brown, dressed in what Brown assumed was a pressure suit. At first, all Brown could see was their own reflection in the figure's helmet, and then with a slight hiss, the helmet became clear, revealing a creature unlike Brown, who had ever seen exposing his teeth in the way Brown had seen predatory biological entities on one do. The figure stared at Brown for a moment, before moving its appendages in a rough approximation of what Brown suddenly realised was an attempt at a formal greeting. Two appendages raised above their head, one lifted from the ground and pointed behind them. Without the additional two lower appendages, the gesture looked slightly off, but Brown found themselves both impressed and slightly less overwhelmed than they'd been just a moment before, and after a brief pause, they returned the gesture. The creature's teeth became more visible, and Brown wondered if that signalled excitement or predatory intent. Of the rapid consideration, they assumed the first. I want to help you because we're explorers, and we don't leave anyone behind. Brown gazed at the creature, the human, before he stuck one of his appendages out. Brown stared at it. We call this a handshake, it's a customary greeting. You grab hold of the appendage end and gently move it up and down. Brown watched the appendage for a moment, before slowly extending one of their own upper appendages and wrapping their manipulators around it and moving it slowly up and down. Brown noticed the human's teeth became even more visible. The name's Theodore McKellen, but call me Teddy. I'm the commander of the melee. It is truly an honour to meet you. Brown watched the human, and then slowly expanded their primary orifice, showcasing the sharp expulsion muscles just within. Greetings, Teddy. I believe the honour is mine. Teddy seemed to watch the orifice with great interest, or concern, and Brown wondered if they'd misunderstood before Teddy suddenly made a noise which the machination once again translated as exalted noise generated to signal humour, and Teddy's teeth became more exposed than ever. Come on, let's get you inside and off this rock. Teddy placed a large arm over Brown and began to divert him to the interior of the hovering craft. Biological male entity, I'm glad you all have a similar culture to ours. When the machination told me you had developed metaphonological and allegorical language system and an identity of existence that matched ours, I was excited. To let you in on a little secret, I actually skipped most of my first contact lectures. Stupid me, I know. Crass language to signal emphasis. I don't know what I would have done if you were quasi-spatial or crass language to signal emphasis or hive intelligence. Probably wouldn't have been able to drop out of the sky like that with such a uh, crass language to signal emphasis. Crass language to signal emphasis speech, eh? What are the chances, right? Imagine the look on your crewmates faces when they get back and find you sitting there right as rain. Although I'm hoping your government doesn't try to shoot me or something, that'd be a real shame. Hopefully you'll be able to help me with that, right? I'm helping you out, similar value systems, similar moral systems. Hopefully they'll see this as an act of good faith. As they moved into the ship and the door began to shut behind them, Teddy moved to what Brown assumed was the pilot's seat, continuing to talk the entire time. Well, either way, if I mess it up too badly, we can always bring in the unknown governmental organisation to help smooth things over. Those unknown adjectives implying both intelligence and lack of physical capability love first contact. As the door shut behind them, Brown looked out at the spot they had accepted would be their final resting spot and wondered at their chances and luck. The last thing they saw as the ramp closed was the stars twinkling softly overhead. Maybe the universe really did have a soft spot for explorers.